Welcome to Classroom 5.0, a podcast that uncovers industry insights, cutting-edge research and practical evidence-based strategies that help us all to imagine and design learning environments and pathways for this ever-evolving world so that together we can best support the next gen to uncover and deliver their unique potential. This episode has been recorded from our hometown of Port Macquarie, which we're grateful to share and enjoy alongside the traditional owners of Beer Pie Country, whose ongoing cultures and connections to lands and waters we celebrate, and whose elders, past, present and emerging, we pay our respect to. I'm Marianne Power, psychologist and co-founder of the Posify Group. I have the absolute pleasure and privilege in time for Mental Health Awareness Month to be welcoming Graham Cohen. Graham helps leaders and teams to be more caring, resilient, and growth oriented. And he's also been working in schools as well. So this is an episode for all of our listeners, be it in education or organizations. In Graham's earlier career, he worked in senior leadership positions with Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, and A.T. Kearney. In 2000, he went through a five year depression episode, which his psychiatrist at the time described as the worst they'd ever seen. He came out of that experience in this crisis with a different view about how we can increase our resilience, mood and performance. He's described by the Australian Financial Review as a workplace resilient expert. And he's the author of four books, including the internationally acclaimed Back from the Brink, which is a testimonial from the former UK Prime Minister, Tony Blair, and which has become a bestseller in China. He attributes his writing prowess to religiously reading every edition of Rugby League Week when he was in year 12, which I am definitely keen to learn more about, Graham, (laughs) and a particular interest helped to start Are You OK? in 2009 and remains an active board director. Graham is also the host of his own podcast, The Caring CEO, which I can highly recommend. I think I've just about dug into every episode now, and I have to say, over and above your incredible, impressive, personal and professional bio, if you like. Graham, you're just an outstanding human and it's just, it's such a treat to have you here. So thank you for joining us and welcome to Classroom 5.0. <laughs> My pleasure, Marianne. It's really lovely to be with you as well. Oh, I was just so struck. Uh, you, so you and I collided and didn't really actually get the chance to officially meet, but through the Serenity Collective, which we're both, um, which we're both at the time keynote speaking for the thriving workplace, of course, but but quite heavily involved in. And there's so much about about your work and your commitment to not only mental health and resilience, but just to amplifying the voices of kind humans that really struck a chord with me. So so this is really special. But you know, given that so many of our audience are interested in you and your uh, your linkage of, of rugby league to your, your writing and your impressive and your impressive authorship skills I have to ask okay first of all who's your team and secondly what was that about in your 12 start there for us it really became a bit of a joke between my wife and I because my wife was a voracious reader you know she read all the classics and wow and, you know, she once won a you know, a snooty reading award when she was at uh, at school, and you know, English was a very, very strong subject of hers. And me, I was much more maths and science oriented and and sport oriented. Mm-hmm. I played uh, rugby league myself, and I had one um, you know ritual it was every every Friday going down to a news agent when, when we used to have news agents and purchasing copy of rugby Gosh. league week. So every time she asked me if I read a book, I always say, no, but I read Rugby League Week. <laughs> Rugby League Week has any wisdom, life wisdom, but, uh, you know, it was just a, a real passion and interest of mine. And, um, yeah, it was a ritual for me. <laughs> Aww. And, and I miss the team. I'm sure there are people who are busting to know. Uh, St. George. St. George. Oh. Laura, I've been a, a Dragon supporter my whole life and, uh, yeah, a mad follower of that group. Oh, incredible. They're doing well. <laughs> I have to say, we, we've come from from a family whose team isn't doing so well. So I might not mention it or I'll be in trouble with my family back home. <laughs> but it's always fun to have a bit of banter around rugby season time. Oh, Graham, well, you know, in addition to that love of rugby and to hearing a little bit about your learning, as I shared before, what really struck me was the authenticity and the connection and commitment that you've had to well-being and resilience. But for those who perhaps aren't so familiar with your personal story and, and how that's really informed your professional meaningful work and purpose would you mind starting there and sharing a little bit about about what you've learned and what you're teaching now to others 
Yeah, sure. About, uh, well, it was back in 2003, I was a vice president for Carney, a global consulting firm, and there were some real disruptions in the market where business collapsed and, and basically I collapsed as well. I'd, I'd had hmm. probably about three or four episodes of depression before, but this was just in another league. You know, in a very, very short period of time, I lost my job, my marriage broke down and uh, became estranged from my kids and had to go and live with my parents. So it was a very, very, very difficult time. And in the midst of that, you know, I really felt that uh, I would never get better. And, and a real hopelessness came into it. Um, and I'm sure anyone who, who's listening that that has experienced depression would relate mm. to that. You know, it goes for a time and then you feel that it's all out of your control. And mm. um, you know, I tried everything. I had BCT or shock therapy. I had psychotherapy. Wow. I had kinesiology. I had all sorts of medications and stuff. And um, and was just very, very, very desperate. And mm. and I'd, I'd like to say that my recovery was rapid, but it was very, very slow. It took about a year, I guess. And mm. I started to, um, you know, start walking and uh, walking regularly in nature. And that was really something that got me outside my head and yeah or into just being present and there was a natural mood boost with walking as well and then I uh, reconnected with uh, family and friends you know when I was depressed I was sort of ashamed to be in that place but I decided to reach out and you know those interactions really helped you know I, mm. I, often, I was a bit nervous about you know going to those meetings or coffees or having a beer, but afterwards mm. I at least I did. And then probably a real pivotal time for me was then deciding to write my first book, Back from the Brink. And um, that was where I interviewed 12 Australians, um, some really well known, some not, and uh, just about their journey and how they did it. And I think working on something like that, you know, gave me mm. a real uh, purpose and um, really led to me um, persisting and then finally launching that book. And it was launched at the Black Dog Institute by John Brogdon, who was a previous opposition leader in New South Wales, who'd had his own battles. Yeah. And um, that was a real game changer. And I think because of him launching it, being at the Black Dog Institute and Having some well-known Australians as part of that led to lots of inquiries about, um, lots of publicity. I did a number of interviews over the following uh, in a month, really. And, uh, and then I, I really learned from that when I did, went to book signings and was on Talkback Radio. Mm -hmm. but most of the people contacting me were actually those that were trying to support someone. And mm -hmm. that was a bit of insight for me. I didn't realise really how much my uh, illness had affected those around me. And so that led to me writing my, my second book, which is the, uh, <laughs> this one here, which is Back from the Brink 2, uh, How to Best Help a Loved One Overcome Depression. And then through those books, I met uh, Gavin Larkin back in 2009, and he had this idea for Are You OK Day? And uh, when he told me about it, I thought, this is fantastic, because I knew how central my parents support were for me to me recovering you know don't, mm. i really don't made it without without them and so you know with really no employees no real budget you know wow. we, we put something together um and launched it at parliament house in canberra both gavin spoke who'd lost his father to suicide and i also spoke because i had uh, you know attempted suicides on a few occasions and been really fortunate enough to to survive those, and um, and we had this common bond. You know, he had this regret of losing his father. Or I had this relief of not putting my family through the same things. Mm. And uh, even from the first year, I helped to put together the first workplace program. And in that first year, we had I think about thirty seven companies participate. And wow! It, it is just you know grown massively since then yeah not just in the workplace but also very much in households schools programs, households and schools and we've also got 
specialist programs together for a unique industry, like we've done one for the rail industry, the hospitality industry, the legal industry, the motor, the motor industry sort of thing. And I think they are quite powerful because they mm -hmm. use language that's relevant for those um, for those groups. Mm -hmm. And uh, and also it helps to get away from just having one are you okay day a year. If you look at our yes. website, there is just it just says are you okay? And we will always have a a day because it provides a point of focus and it also uh, allows us to really build some momentum for that period of the year. But we're really striving towards are you okay three six five when you Ooh, know yeah. every day of the year. Yes, yeah. Oh gosh, there, there's so many things that you just said. I want to point to. First of all, I mean, congratulations. I, I don't think there is a household in Australia, at least if not globally, that isn't familiar with Are You Okay? At least in its day. And I've personally um, really enjoyed seeing the movement evolve. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, being able to sit with you and hear a little bit about the story. I mean, even to have 37 companies sign up in the first year, that's that's incredible. And back in 2009, really, when, mm -hmm. when mental health didn't have the same awareness and lack of stigma or, you know, reduced stigma that it, that it has now. And I think that's really credit to you and your colleagues and, and obviously the work by Black Dog Institute and lots of institutes um, coming together to raise awareness. So, so yeah, f just reflecting on that. Um, but what I have enjoyed seeing evolve as well is is moving from that conversation of awareness and 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 yes, checking in and asking the question. But I think what you're doing so cleverly is really giving people those practical skills and strategies uh, that we know work from the evidence, but also some some communication starting tips and starting mm. points. I think um, you know it's one thing to to ask that question, "Are you okay?" But to know how to hold that information um, mm. afterwards is is something quite different. But but how have you been exploring that? And I'm curious with that question, both. I guess how that was as as a lived experience, somebody who's um, been through depression and had mental health, um, but then also is trying to educate others on hold, how to hold the responses. Yeah, well, there's a a social activist called Cindy Gallup, and she has a great saying. She says mm -hmm. the the largest untapped resource in the world is those that want to help but don't know how to do it. Huh. And, I, and I think that is just brilliant because yeah. most people, we know that most people would like to help a loved one or a colleague that's struggling. Mm. And right in the beginning, we asked why people didn't ask, are you okay in the workplace? And the first thing was they didn't know how to start the conversation. And then, right. the, second, and then the second thing was they were afraid the person they asked might say, no, I'm not okay. And, not and then what do you do with that? What to do? Yeah. 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 So we've done a lot of work around just um, building a mindset and knowledge to have that uh, conversation. And mm. we stress, we don't want people to be psychologists or psychiatrists. You know, the biggest thing you can do, and this is a huge thing, is show care and support for that person, show that you generally care and encourage mm. them to seek help, whether it's going to see their GP or calling a helpline or doing an anonymous assessment of their mood online. You know, mm. encouraging people to take that step and then to follow on, follow up mm. and to see if they have done it, what they learned from that. Or if they haven't, just encourage them to revisit it because the the aim of the um, Are You OK? day and, and also my broader work is about um, not just having that conversation, but encourage the help seeking, the follow up mm. and um, hopefully giving pixel insights to you know how to how to uh, have a better life and know you recover you, that, when you're going through it as i mentioned before you you do feel like it will last forever and that's the mm. big message that i share with my story and and when i do it's just amazing how many people come up either directly afterwards or when I'm, you know back in the corner getting a coffee and just share that you know, they've been through it or their husband's been through it or their daughter and um, all themselves and, uh, you know, just share that. And it's almost a relief, I think. And, and when this is a, a big part of storytelling, when you share your story, mm. it gives people permission to share theirs and everyone's got a story. Mm. <laughs> everyone's got a story. They sure do. And I love that you're amplifying so many stories as well through your work and through your podcast, The Caring CEO. 
Um, and I can't help but think also that it does take courage to share a story. Um, you know, one of the reasons I, I really resonated with a lot of, of what you've shared is that, um, and I've shared on this podcast before, I've come into my own work through my own history of, of mental health and then into psychology and now co-founding with the Posify Group. And for me, that intersection of meaning and purpose and why it's so powerful is because I can see both professionally and have experienced personally how it can serve as um, as a vehicle for post-traumatic growth and to your point um, as as an as an agent of change as you're moving through a clinical episode um, but then also in bolstering resilience and and helping people move towards high potential and and their greatest aspirations um, and so you know I'm really curious Graham what are you noticing as you're stepping um, beyond the conversation of, of clinical awareness and, and reaching out for clinical treatment and then into workplaces around resilience and being a caring leader in general around this idea of meaning and purpose and and all of the positive psychology um, I guess strategies that we know today what are you noticing mm. is popping up for people there's been a massive change in the last two years, two and a half years with the whole pandemic and crisis. And mm. it really has brought mental health to the front and center in organizations and to, and to the leadership group of, uh, of companies. And I did a, um, a, a, a webinar last week with the Culture Inc group. And mm. they're a group that measures, you know, um, culture and well-being and all this sort of stuff and it was a mess it, we had 2024 attendees i was just talking about wow. how, to, how to better support people in the workplace and mm. the thing that i think helps is there is definitely much more literacy and understanding mm -hmm. about the areas but there still is stigma and i found that there are certain things that help to reduce that stigma like i i don't talk of diagnoses or this sort of stuff. I talk of a moodometer, you know, mm. not 10. And the top third is the, the green zone, middle third is the amber zone, and bottom um, is the is the uh, the red zone. And somehow, talking about a moodometer, which everyone can relate to, we all go up and yeah. down, it does help to reduce the stigma. And I encourage, you know, leaders and teams when they you know, had their weekly meetings, you know, what zone are you in this week? You know, how are you going? And yeah. that allows us to provide greater communication support to those that could be sliding into the uh, amber or even the, in the red zone. So that's been a really good element. But, um, you know, I, I, I believe so much in creating cultures of care in the workplace. And that was the reason behind starting the Caring CEO podcast, where we have these mm -hmm. amazing figures the champion about the culture of care and a culture of high performance. But I also believe that every leader's number one priority is to build more caring and resilient teams who enjoy growing together. And that is really having this care mindset. For those of us, for those mm. that are watching, you'll be able to see behind me the care triad or what we call a we care mindset. And that's where we champion self-care which is our personal care and, and resilience. Crew care, which is about building psychological safety across a team and building resilience. And red zone care is how we help those and assist those that are struggling and um, need, need some support and help. And, uh, you know, all three elements of those have been very, very important. You know, around Are You OK Day, I get asked to speak about the red zone. Um, last year, I did, I think it was, I think it was like 100 um, webinars on self-care, building resilience for uncertain times. Wow. Doesn't that just speak to the, yeah, the conversation in the room that must have been happening for so many organizations as well? That's incredible. Yeah. And, then, and then this year, it's gone much more to the crew care side of things. You know, how huh. do we build psychologically safe and resilient teams. And this is particularly relevant when, you know, some of us are working remotely, some of us are working in the yeah. office, some will never return. And so we need to think about ways we can engage groups virtually, as well as one-on-one. -on -one. You know, nothing can replace the power of one-on-one -on -one to build trust and respect and that sort of mm. thing. But once you have that, you can certainly keep it going um, by 
you know, regular Zooms or, or Skypes or Teams or whatever. Um, and so it's it's a new world. It will never return to what it was before. And, you know, we will have um, potentially, you know, a much better workplace, you know, once we sort of learn how to operate in, in this, these rapidly changing environments, there is more flexibility. You know, people are, are able to work in the country and, you know, have a city salary. You know, there's some real, real upsides. Or even if you're, you know, two or three hours away from the city, you might have to go in for one or two days rather than five days uh, to, to work. So potentially, you know, and many people experience this, a much better lifestyle through having this option of working where you want to work. Yeah, absolutely. I I love that you're starting to shine a light on the idea that, you know, we won't return to what we've had. I think there was a little bit of a push for, you know, what's the new normal? And really, I think there's 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 a benefit of taking perspective and taking check and and hold and saying, well, what have we learned? You know, where were the gaps before? Where are the opportunities today? Um, And I can't help but think, you know, as you talk about this hybrid model and and particularly using that, you know, that care for teams and how can we best support building resilience? I'm also thinking of the little people in our classrooms who kind of got thrusted back into the old way of being it's, you know COVID's done everybody back to the classroom and yeah. I've spoken to so many students and teachers alike who of course wanted to get back to face-to-face education but there was a little mm. bit of a almost a gap of or, or, or almost a missed opportunity that I hope we're coming back to now and I'm curious to hear your thinking of some of the practical ways that you're seeing workplaces are evolving and adapting and taking on this idea of hybrid work and how we might sort of reimagine our, our learning environments to do the same so that we're providing psychological safety for the little people who are there mm-hmm. to learn and also their educators and, and staff as well. What are you seeing works well? Yeah, I think it has been particularly challenging for teachers um, mm. and, and the students. It really has. Like many were just thrown in the deep end and, mm. and suddenly were asked to convert a, you know, a, a six-hour <laughs> face-to-face classroom to a six-hour virtual Teams or Zoom. Oh. And, and, you know, that is just impossible. The you know, ultimate this. design challenge, not to mention how much organic learning happens in the face-to-face environment and how to replicate that or duplicate that online, you know, hats yeah. off to teachers and parents and, and kids. And and uh, that has been really, really difficult. And then along with that, you know, those that are, you know, probably 13 or 14 up to 25 years old, Mm. but had it really tough, mm. really tough. And they have been the ones that have had the most mental health challenges. You know, yeah. research, there's obviously about three different pieces of research in Australia that say between 40 and 49% of, you know, those Gen Y and Gen Zs mm. have had mental health challenges. And and when you think about it, you know, that time of your life is so much more about your friends yeah. and other people and less Connection. about your family less about your family and because of the restrictions there was much much less face-to-face contact which uh, was very very difficult and then overlaying that with you know trying to learn in that environment uh, you've not got a, um, a nephew who started you know first year university in the first year of COVID wow he never, he never went in you know no and that whole experience of connecting with new people new ideas new insights New socialising, you know, just yeah. was, um, this was lost. And so that's, I think, the first thing I want to acknowledge is that it was very, very difficult to make that happen. Mm. Hey there, I wanted to tell you about an exciting and innovative solution we've been designing to help solve this problem of how we best prepare the next gen for an ever-evolving world and future workforce that's going to demand a whole new set of skills and mindsets in order for them to thrive. The POSIFY Academy is Australia's first student-led, evidence-based and curriculum-aligned wellbeing and career development platform, helping young people aged 10 to 14 uncover and deliver their unique potential. It's the first of a trilogy series that's helping young people move seamlessly and with confidence from education and into industry as they design a life and a career of impact. Teaching skills like communication, compassion, creativity, critical thinking, agility, curiosity, resilience, problem solving, all those human capability skills that we talk about here on this podcast and connecting them with a sense of purpose. 
To learn more, you can visit theposifygroup.com.au forward slash posify dash academy. Now, back to the show. There, there are now, however, lots of ways to promote greater interaction and learning um, with what happens. And just some of the things that I've seen work really well and which I utilise with my webinars is, you know, being able to poll the audience and find out what's yeah. going on. Yeah, that, that's spent, you know, do this several times to find out what's happening and, and to really strive to make things interactive and to encourage people to contribute ideas or questions um, and uh, really welcome those contributions and, and encourage them to build that sort of psychological safety. Mm. There's also another thing which is, you know, very um, helpful is, is breakout rooms and breakout groups where you can yeah. get the smaller teams to uh, talk about some of the issues and then report back to the greater audience. So that can be a great way also. And then there's, you know, um, things like virtual whiteboards, you know, where people can contribute ideas and, and build a bit, bit of consensus around it. So they can be made, um, you know, attractive and very interactive if they're done well. And particularly when you know, production standards improve, you know, better camera, better lighting, better sound, all that sort of stuff. Um, and and being a professional speaker, myself and others have really lifted their game in that regard and, and moved much more to having greater production flexibility. And always, you know, I've got a little mini studio here for, um, you know, doing, doing those presentations. Um, the live groups, do something that you, you just can't replicate in a virtual. Mm. So, you know, in a, in a live session, you can read the room as a teacher or as a yeah. leader, or even somewhere there. You can look around and you can look at the expression there of someone's distracted as someone's thing, but it disappears when you look at a flat screen with either yeah. Zoom or Teams. So, I think particularly for teachers and students as well. Yeah. I'm not sure about your family, but I noticed mm -hmm. um, with the schools that my kids were at at the time, you know, our policy was that they weren't allowed to have their faces, that they, that because of different privacy rules. Yeah. Um, and I really felt for the teachers because without the kids electively jumping into the chat or, or making a comment or, or speaking up, you know, how do you read the room in that virtual environment? Well, that's a very counter counterproductive directive to turn off cameras. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, the, I don't know who gave that advice and why they gave that advice. And Again, uh, why we're working to reimagine the future of learning here, Graham. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Some of our yeah. older policies that were there for really good reasons probably aren't necessarily going to serve us well as we move forward and we're still needing to have hybrid learning spaces and hybrid workspaces. And, and also with the science of learning, Mm. You know, we, we know that 50% of the learning happens after the actual event. So if you're doing a session, 50% happens after the event. So it's very important to think about how you keep momentum going. Yeah. And, um, and that really led to me um, co-founding a new company called Factor C. Mm. And we now have programs, really engaging e-learning programs, that keep the momentum going and embed that learning and space that learning, which uh, means that people can embrace it and make it part of the culture sort of thing. And I think that's been a good development um, of this virtual world is thinking about other ways to keep that learning progressing over a year and beyond sort of thing. Mm, so much of what you're speaking to, and I'd really love to learn more about that, that um, find those findings that you've got around learning. I'm sure our audience would too, and how you're sort of scaffolding the learning experience there. This is um, reminding me of an earlier episode we did actually for our listeners. Um, I refer back to Lindsay Rattray, where he, he's done a lot of research into how we can use tech for better student engagement. Um, mm. So yeah, I want to refer our listeners back there and I'll, I'll throw that into our show notes. Uh, but tell me a little bit about the learning platforms that you've used and how that's helped to reinforce some of the lessons, particularly around resilience and how you're seeing that work in both the corporate space and at schools? Yeah, well, we first of all need to understand the Ebenhaus forgetting curve, Ebenhausen forgetting curve. And basically mm -hmm. what that says is that within a day, no matter how good you or I are, people will forget 
So that's, that's a that's lot. What, that's what like, oh, I'm only going to learn 25% if I don't really <laughs> sharpen my attention here. Yeah. Yeah, but there's this academic from uh, Cornell University. I've just got a mental blank on his name. But what he basically found was that when you look at learning effectiveness, 24% happens before the event. How you mm. prime people, how you let them know what's happening, um, how you engage with them before the actual event. Now, the actual event contributes 26%. Um, so it's it's hardly huge, that, that actual wow. time. Yeah. And, and in most cases, like I, I've got a slide on this, which I, I just can't remember exactly, but companies spend about 85% of their money, and, and it's probably the same with schools, mm -hmm. <laughs> on the actual event rather than what follows. And the, the follows, as I mentioned before, contributes 50% of the learning effectiveness. The companies, I don't know about schools, but companies spend on average about 12% on that sort of thing, or 12 to 15%. Wow. And so if, if we do think of clever ways on how to keep that learning going, it can make yes. a, a real difference. And so just by way of example, how I've made that work with managers, one of, the, one of the programs we have is called We Care Manager. And it's about how managers you know, identify someone who's struggling, how to have the mm. Are You OK conversation, and then to give them really some very helpful resources to encourage the help seeking. So we have this uh, you know, introductory video we send out before the event. We then might have a you know, webinar for 45 minutes, and then they commence a We Care Manager program. And what that wow. is, is a 55-minute really engaging in learning that you can easily do you know, on a phone. And mm. it's very, very interactive, very engaging. And, uh, you know, they, they complete that 50 minutes. Then they receive 12 nudge videos. So it's hmm. one each week for 12 weeks. And they yeah. have just two-minute two videos that share a little snippet of the course and encourage that person to turn that knowledge into action. And, uh, and then the third component we use is something which we call a, a We Care Momentum portal. And that's a, um, an online portal that uh, the project team or the client can access. Uh, and there's usually other project team, it could be five, five, usually about five or 10 people that are part of that. And so there's a whole lot of free resources there to help them plan a launch of an initiative, how to have a really big and significant launch, and then how to keep the momentum going with you know, videos, newsletter copy, help sheets, and other resources for the year ahead. And again, it's just all about really trying to change that culture by encouraging people to put that knowledge into action. And uh, to the educators out there, you know, there's a great saying which says, you know, the purpose of education isn't knowledge, it's action. You know? Mm. <laughs> you know, putting it into practice in a way that, you know, is meaningful to you sort of thing. So that's just, I guess, one way. And the way that we've made it very easy, um, they can either use our learning management system but in most cases, they use theirs. And so we can put what's called a SCORM huh. package onto yeah. the learning management program. And it just means, you know, they, the employees can access it as, as simply as they access the learning, their own learning management program. So it just makes it, just takes out one of the barriers to getting people engaged and involved. Uh, and I couldn't agree. That is such an important obstacle. And I mean, I know we've got educators listening right now. And uh, if you're anything like me, some words like implicit versus explicit learning might be coming up, but also how you can take those explicit lessons um, to your point, Graham, that, that sounds like they've, they've been presented in that webinar format, but really turn them into more inquiry based um, practices. Uh, and I think that's where the magic happens. And where as you know, learning environments, we can really start to curate our experiences and opportunities for the little people in our room. Uh, we've all got 
I think such unique learning uh, cohorts and cultures mm-hmm. in the same way that every workplace is different, you know, whether it be a school or, or a homeschooling community or, or even a coaching group uh, for basketball, you know, we, we, we all be, build these little cultures. And so I really love that um, what you've shared has helped challenge my thinking around not only how can we present information and then those opportunities or invitations to explore, but also how we might curate that process, thinking about the science and when learning actually happens. So um, hmm, I might have to turn some of that to the design when we're when we're launching the Posify Academy as well. <laughs> Thank you, Graham. And I'm sure you would have discussed this before because of the nature of your podcast, but I'm sure you've come across the Khan Academy. You yes. know, where yeah, where they've created yeah. this, this massive library of lessons. Absolutely. That are online on, on YouTube that anyone in the world can access. But in the Western world, you know, it's been very much thought about how you flip the classroom, how people can yeah. do the learning and the pro and the process of the learning on something like the Khan Academy or, or equivalent platforms. And then with the actual um, classroom time, it becomes interactive learning and application and, and uh, you know, how we turn knowledge into action. And by actually using that knowledge you have and actually applying it, that, of course, just embeds the learning all that much more. Absolutely. You are going to have listeners who are just hallelujah for Graham, because I think one thing that does unite is this idea that, you know, as we move forward and reimagine what an educator is and what our role as educators. And I say that Mm. and include not just the formal teacher, as we would traditionally think, but, you know, industry leaders as well who are coming to Mm. join us to reshape the future mindsets and skills of the next generation. But but that that role shifting from being, you know, expert out the front to actually being a coach and to being a leader and to help yeah. really unpack someone's unique potential. Um, and so I'm curious as we come towards the end of today's interview to learn from you, you've had the opportunity to sit with so many caring CEOs and leaders who just seem to have at that core an understanding of the value of of leading person-centric and human-centric and with kindness. Um, mm. But I wonder as we start to think about our role as educators, um, what we might learn from those caring CEOs what are some of those qualities or things that we might want to focus on as we step into coaching, facilitating and leading? Yeah, I think one common uh, factor or quality that comes through with everyone is their humility. <laughs> they, really, yeah. they, they don't have massive, massive egos. They really don't. And mm. they know they don't have all the answers. They know that they have to tap into those around them to get the best answers the best results and I love the um, the mindset of a, a hedge fund manager called Ray Dalio and he talks about how to have a culture where the best ideas win huh. how great is that how great yeah. is that and, and he actually he's got a TED talk on it but he talks about how they achieve that in their organization how everyone from a you know <laughs> a second year intern to the CEO contributes to solving problems so I think that's the that's a a really significant element and you know for example um, Mike Schneider who's the CEO of of Bunnings yeah what he calls the the um, four H's of leadership and that is honesty humility helpfulness and happy and and how great is that but but he also promotes connection and, you know, I think this really relates to the classroom as well, is that everyone's on the same level. Everyone in mm-hmm. Bunnings is referred to as a team member. So even though they've got, they got 55,000 people, they're all team members. And to give you some idea of Mike's humility, when he goes out, you know, to, to a social thing, they ask him what he does. And he says, oh, I'm, I work at Bunnings. And then the, the first question is, oh, which door? <laughs> Paul McCrory, I love that. <laughs> so the humility is definitely a, a big, big thing. And and also encouraging people to shape the future. And um, mm. Pat Greer, former CEO of um, Ramsey, was really, yes. really part of that. And he talked about leading from behind. And what he meant by that was creating a great vision, 
and the great vision for Ramsey was being acknowledged independently as the best healthcare provider in Australia. That was a very clear mm. vision for them. But every time he visited a CEO at a different hospital or a director of nursing, would ask, mm. what can you do to deliver on that on that vision? They'd come up with their respective ideas. And Matt, uh, so Pat would then encourage them to make it happen. Coach from behind. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure leaders can and, and teachers can apply mm. that same process. If they get a student to buy into something they're interested in or something that they can apply, that mm. can make all the difference. You know, I've had... Uh, I've got a, a good friend who, after working as a general manager in finance for until he was fifty, decided to go back and get his dip ed, and he's now oh, a wow. he's now a, a teacher in a um, private school in in Sydney. But he really he 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 just get he really engages his team by thinking about how we apply this if we've got a rental property. What do we do? How do we buy it? What do we do? Mm. He does it with cryptocurrency and. It just increases because they're hearing all this stuff about Bitcoin, and and if he can show them how we can apply economics to cryptocurrency, it's relevant. It's something that they're all talking about and thinking about, and so helping them to co-create that future of learning, I think, is a is a great mindset. Yeah, absolutely, co-creation, and and I've heard you know to me those words of autonomy and self mastery, self determination, some of those principles mm -hmm. that we know are so important, but often maybe don't pay as much attention to. It sounds like they're working in the corporates, so bringing them back into our education spaces as we start to reimagine the future of learning is is definitely on point. Thank you for sharing those examples, and and particularly to Mike. Actually, that's where I first came across your work, Graham. Was was listening to your interview, and um and throwing Throwing in that fifth H of hope, and I think um, you know Martin Seligs Seligman's work around hope and how relevant it is as we navigate this new way forward, um, or looking at what life is like, um, yeah. and, and remembering remembering that we've got stories from from those before us who have moved through challenging circumstances and not just done so to come out with with that sense of humility, but and resilience, but also a, a deeper inner knowing that that like you is being shared with others. Um, so yeah, I've just got such utmost respect and, and gratitude and appreciation for how you've taken your life experience, your lived experience and combined that with your professional acumen and know-how to then um, to share with others how we can live more meaningful lives. And before I let you go, Graham, um, and of course you, you will have seen me madly writing actually as we've been talking and, uh, and I'm going to throw all the links to everything that Graham's referenced into our show notes as always. So if you haven't already, make sure you do sign up to Classroom 5.0. Uh, that's where you'll find our episode web pages and fun sheets and all of the links to today's episode. Um, but Graham, I have to ask you because it's burning. If if you were to wave a magic wand and take everything that you've learned about being caring and kind, resilience and, and meaning and purpose and living a really authentic life, what's something that you would like to see changed moving forward or that you hope for as we reimagine the future of learning? I think it, I think it uh, and, and I finish my keynotes by saying this, I say, you know, be caring, be helpful and go for the growth zone. So the caring mm -hmm. is about self-care and caring for those around us. And if we do that, we're going to be in a, a well-connected group. Be Helpful just thinks about how we can continually improve to assist those around us and be really open to the idea that when we help others, it helps ourselves. And, uh, and go for the growth zone just means going outside your comfort zone on a regular basis to learn new things. You know, you'll stuff it up a few times, but each <laughs> time you'll learn something and it will fuel your growth going forward. And uh, so that would be what I would say, be caring, be helpful and go for the growth son. Oh, that's magical, Graham. Thank you for not only modeling those things, but inspiring us all. I know I'm leaving today's conversation with my own growth zone of how to think about how we're designing our educational experiences. Uh, but how can other people find you off the back of this conversation and, and learn more about your work? Where's the best place to stay in touch? Uh, probably uh, through uh, LinkedIn, I'm most, most active. And I know there's a number of educators on LinkedIn as well, but also Definitely. Instagram as well. I've got some... Um, Instagram 
pages for, but I'm, I'm most. I active. did notice that. I might have tagged you in today, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good fun, Graham Cohen, and of course, active on LinkedIn. I always love seeing the posts you share. You're so generous with those practical tips that you're coming across to help your own well-being and the well-being of others. Um, so I would encourage everybody to find Graham on LinkedIn, and, and we'll definitely put your your contacts in in the page. Well, Graham, thank you again, not only for today, for the incredible impact work that you're doing, and for really being that super connector of all people caring and kind and ready to make the world a better place. It's been a pleasure, pleasure speaking to you today. My pleasure, Marion. It's been great to be with you. <laughs> Thanks to all who have listened to today's episode of Classroom 5.0. That's all we have time for today. But as always, we will see you back on our homepage and episode page. And next time, see you later, alligators. Classroom 5.0 is brought to you by the Posify Group, a socially conscious education company arming the next gen with a sense of purpose and the future skills they'll need to thrive in this ever-evolving world. Your ratings and reviews really mean the world to us, so if you loved this episode, do let us know and share it with a friend. We'd like to say thanks to our editing guru, Clint Rance, and his team at My Video Producer, who helped us put this show together. And for today's show notes, links, and more episodes just like these, you can visit theposifygroup.com.au forward slash podcast. Thanks for helping us imagine alive the future of learning. See you next time.